I'm Leslie Cornwell, Certified Nurse Midwife with Midwifery Business Consultation. I have a treat for you guys today. Um, a couple of great connections have been sent my way. Katia Lamone is a midwife for the Mennonites in Mexico. And I feel like that's just like the most amazing headline to expand on. So Katia, if you want to tell us about your amazing background in history and we'll go from there. Okay, my name's Katia Lamon. I've been a midwife since, um, officially since 1991. Um, but the last six years I've been living here in Quatemoc or outside the town of Quatemoc, Chihuahua. That's about five hours, depending on how fast you drive, five hours south of El Paso, Texas on the border. And um, most of my career was on the US-Mexican border as serving those home birth families up there. I'm a certified professional midwife. Um, and I have a background in public health. So when I first finished public health, I went over to Africa because I could. <laughs> and um, I was just, I was teaching school over there, but every chance I got, I went and worked with the midwives. And that sort of cemented my desire to go and study. That was in the 80s. And then I got my training on the border in a birth center, Maternidad La Luz, back in 91. Very cool. Oh my God. So you mentioned to me before we started recording, you ended up in Mexico because they asked you to come there. Like kind of tell me that background and um, what you've grown in the community just in a five short years. It's so impressive to me what you've done. <laughs> yeah, that, that's quite a long story. But anyway, um, okay. So in 79, I lived in Mexico for a few months because I wanted to learn Spanish. And when I was in the southern part of Chihuahua in Parral, I met a Raramuri woman, um, Taramara um, tribe. And just on the street, and we started talking and we went to her house, I say in air quotes, because it was basically a cardboard house right so we're sitting in and you know with their little cardboard walls and I'm like this is your house you know I was just horrified by this and so she started fixing some tea and stuff and we were talking about you know our lives and what brought me to Mexico and you know who she was and where she was from and all that stuff and I kept glancing over because there was this bundle that was wrapped up in cloth and I just was like what is that but I didn't I didn't ask and she said you want to know what that is don't you and I said yes she says, it's my instruments. And I'm like, okay, I don't understand. She opened it up and there was some, you know, scissors and a few other things. And she goes, I said, what is this for? And she said, I'm a patera. And I was like, I don't know that word. And so she told me that she helped women when they had babies and she, re, you know, she, she registered them with the government. And that's what, you know, she helped women during pregnancy and later and after they had their babies. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. We don't have those in the United States anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know. And so then she, you know, we parted our ways. I got home to my place where I was living. And there was a letter waiting for me from one of my friends. And she had her baby at the birth center with the mice in El Paso, Texas, which is where I was from. And I was like, Okay, you know, do, 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 the, the universe, yeah, somebody's talking to you. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So a month later, I was back in the States and I started doing, um, I'm sorry, this isn't answering your question, but I think it's. No, I love the, yeah. the history behind it. You're getting it. I, it's perfect. So I started volunteering. It was then the maternity center, Sherry Daniels uh, ran it. That's um, actually where I met Miss Hillary, which is our mutual friend. And um, so I was just doing volunteer work. And at one point, um, I wasn't allowed in the birth register to become clients, things like that. But one day they were short staffed and there was a birth going on. And they called me and they said, Katia, we need you to help. I said, what do you want me to do? She said, just write down everything we say. Okay. And I said, okay, I'm ready. You know, and I'm just scribbling everything down. And I can tell you as a midwife, you know, 30 some odd years later, it was probably one of all the births I've been at. It was probably one of the most horrifying births. Um, it was a shoulder dystocia. It was 
resuscitation. It was a postpartum hemorrhage. It was bundle pressure, which we don't do. I mean, it was all these things that were just, you know, now I just think about, oh my gosh, you know, but everything came, you know, baby was born, mom survived, baby survived, everybody was fine. But it was my, it was the impact on me that made the difference. First, I, I didn't recognize that, you know, I thought, okay, this is normal birth, you know, <laughs> this is how birth happens, you know. Yeah. And so I'm writing all this stuff down and then everybody's on the kitchen table and everybody's just like slumped at the kitchen table going, oh my gosh, that was horrible. Oh my gosh, we got to keep really watch on mom and baby. And, and everything was fine. But I was like high. I was going around massaging each of you, going from shoulder to shoulder, massaging their shoulders. Going, that was great. First, I was in a room with five people, and then I was in a room with six people. And I was just like bursting with energy. And I knew at that moment, well, one of them said, oh, she's going to be one. I was like, do you think I could? And they go, yeah, you're, you're going to be a midwife. If you could go through that. That's like and be still worst, excited and not like. The worst birth that any of us have ever been at, and you still want to be, you're going to be a midwife. I'm like, really? And then at that moment, I could see that I was not only going to be a midwife, but my purpose was going to be more, I was going to be teaching other women to be a midwife. And I knew that from the moment that I knew I was going to be a midwife. Oh, cool. So everything after that, it, you know, it took me another 10, 11 years before I actually got to go to a midwifery school and train. In the meantime, reading books, doing this stuff. I was in Africa. I caught babies in Africa, helped midwives there on mostly basic health care. Um, I, before I went to Africa, I got my master's in public health because I felt it was important to have a good solid, um, because I wanted to be an international midwife, but from the beginning too. Um, and I knew public health was really integral. And this is back when there weren't very many, I mean, that was back in the early eighties when I got that. Um, so when I finally got my training in early, you know, 91, um, I also had my, I was pregnant, had my son that year, and then I started up my practice right away. It, around 2000, I think it was 2008 or 2009, I always have to look it up. Um, I got called to help another midwife with a birth in El Paso, and it was a birth at a hotel, which I just don't like, but she wanted me to help. I said, sure, I'll be there. And it was a Mennonite family from this area. Um, he's a chiropractor. And everything went fine, the birth went fine, but that was my first Mennonite birth. A couple of years later, they got pregnant again, and the midwife that attended the first time had retired, and she sent him my name. So that was probably 2010, something like that. By 2014, I had more Mennonite clients than I had clients from New Mexico in my home birth practice. There were people who were coming up to have their babies in the United States for birth certificates. So I was like, okay, this is interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. And they kept saying, come down, come down, come down. So eventually it was like May of 2014, I did my first trip here. And I visited the hospitals, I visited different people. A lot of women came to me and said, we want you to, to train us as midwives. And I said, well, you know, let me just, you know, see what's going on. Give me, get, get, let me get yeah, my- Yeah, the lay of the land. You need, to, you need to realize what you're getting yourself into. You, yeah, you like the excitement, right. but you, you gotta do yeah. some analysis. Yeah. And maybe somebody can come up to the States and I can train them there, you know? So I was still in that, you know, what's going on. I got to the hospital and started realizing how many of the Mennonites were ending up in C-sections, basically, cause they didn't speak the language. So- oh. The way it works in the social system here is you you go into labor, you're separated from your husband, you you go into this other area, and then when it's time, you go for your C-section, basically. I mean, it's, you know, it's oh. not quite that bad, but it's pretty bad. And so we were meeting with the director, and they had a whiteboard up, and it had all their stats for the whole year. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, you know, trying to keep my mouth shut. And the best I could figure out is they were running 40 to 45% C-section rate overall in the hospital. And then, so I specifically asked them, well, what is your rate in regards to Rado Muri women, Mennonites and Hispanics? And he said, by far the most were the Mennonites. 
And I'm like, why is that? He said, well, the Raramuri come in too fast and the Mexicans won't let us. And I was like, you're really being very honest with me. I didn't say that, but I was like, okay. And I later found out that, you know, these women, they, in Mennonite culture, authority is very important. And the doctor is the authority. The doctor knows best, no matter what. And our biggest struggle here is teaching women, number one, you have rights. Number two, you know your body better than anybody and you need to speak up and say what it is you want and need. It may not work, but you at least have to find that voice, right. speak, yeah. you know? And so that's what we've really concentrated on. Anyway, um, I, I then decided, I talked to the, the ladies who wanted, I said, you don't need a midwifery program, you need a doula program. You need a way to help those women and be in that, that hospital area so that you can encourage them to speak and maybe even speak for them because they don't speak Spanish. Right. And so I said, first we do doula and then we'll see where that goes. So that was in 2014-15. Um, and I ended up moving here in December of 2016, 15, and we opened up the birth center and the school in January of 2016. So I found a house. Um, we, I, I stayed in one part, the birth center was in the other part. Um, and then in late 2016, I went to a talk, which I was, you know, who's giving this talk? It was about humanized birth. And I was like, who in this community even knows what that means, you know? And it was a woman who has been Lamaze trained. And so, and she's a doctor. And um, so she was talking about the history of Lamaze and I'm, I'm, you know, and just the whole movement and, you know, bringing birth back to people as opposed to being run by the medical community. Yeah. And I was fascinated with her talk and it was really good. And I was really glad to meet her. And then the head nurse came up to me and she said, you're Katia. And I said, yes. And she goes, I, can you stay a little bit longer? I want you to meet somebody. And it was the director of the hospital. And his name's Dr. Stafford. Dr. Stafford later became my mentor. And it's why I now have permanent residency is because of Dr. Stafford saying, we need her here. <laughs> you know, kind She's of not that. going anywhere. <laughs> we don't want her leaving. You know? Anyway, so he came up to me and he said, I'm really glad to meet you. I'd like to show you that we want to do a birth room here at the hospital. I'm like, really? Uh, who's going to run this birth room? <laughs> this is what I wanted to know. Well, uh, we don't know that yet, but we want to build a room. I said, build it and they'll come, right? So he takes me, first he shows me the expulsion room, which just imagine everything painted white, lots of machines everywhere and a small little bed, you know, a little plancha place, you know, a, a gurney, but you know, whatever. Birth, yeah. It's not a birthing bed by any stretch. Yeah. It's like an operating room kind of thing. And then they had a twin size bed over, over here in the corner. And I'm, he says, this is what we're thinking of doing. We want to um, put this and then have a, have, a, have a curtain so she can have some privacy. And all I could think of was being in a bed, in a curtain and feeling like I would be in a coffin. I just lost oh. yeah. And I was like, okay, so you don't think they're gonna be smart enough to know what's behind the curtain, you know? Cause he said, we're gonna move everything over and then do a curtain here. I said, you don't think they're smart enough to know what's behind the curtain? I said, at least build, you know, some- The fake awkward... portraits where you can hide it pretty, at least then it's a little more deceptive. <laughs> Try to hide it until you need it. I mean, something. And I said, there are no windows in this room. It was like, it was like an operating room, basically. But it was called the expulsion room. So I was like, Ugh, mechanisms of labor, right? Expulsion, right? <laughs> um, so I said, yeah, I don't know if this is going to really be very comfortable for most women. This like or I said, how honest do you want me to be? It goes, be honest, torture chamber to me. It really does. Do your best bet, hide the equipment behind something you can open up quick when you need it or whatever. 
Um, but you also, you know, just because you have a nice room doesn't mean your doctors are not going to stop doing episiotomies. It's not, not what's on the floor. It's not what's on the walls. Yeah. You can have home birth in an operating room and you can have like, it, it's the, it's the philosophy of care being brought into that room and hospitals exactly. try to do it all over the place. Like I made a natural birth room, but they, it's just the same doctor going from one room to the other. It looks pretty, but yeah. Yeah. That's all it is. It's pretty. So um, he said, well, let me take you to this other room that we're thinking about. And it was a storeroom and had a whole bunch of boxes and weird equipment all over the place. And I walked in and I go, this is more like it. There were four windows, big windows. It was full of light. It looked out onto a courtyard. It was the second floor. So it was down below was just this grassy patch with roses. Aww. And I was like, this could be made. I said, you could put the bathroom over here and you could do this, the bed over here, and you could do this over here. And then you could do that over there. And you could set up so that the, the equipment's over here by the bed. And so he says, will you, will you help us do it? And I said, oh, what's the strings? What's your ultimate goal? What do you want? You know, talk, talk about negotiating, right? Yeah. And I, the upbeat about all that, the end discussion was I would do it as long as the midwives and the doulas were in charge and no doctor, no doctor was allowed in the room unless the midwives and the mom wanted them. Excellent. That was it. No nurses, no doctors. It was run with protocols devised by the midwives. The hospital could have say about it, but mostly it was gonna be our protocols and the, our way of doing things. And we weren't going to do IVs and we weren't going to do episiotomies and we weren't going to do any of that stuff unless it fit into the protocol because it was needed. And he, he agreed to it, right? And so when it, in the discussion, I said, so what's your C-section rate like? And he turned to the head nurse and he goes, what's our C-section rate? And she said, about 80%. And I was like, eight or 80, because this was all in Spanish. Did I misunderstand what she said, eight, zero? She goes, yeah, might even be more. I said, 80%. So he, the doc turned to me and goes, so do you think you could help us with that? And oh, I said, eight, we can get rid of that zero. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I could do that, you know, with my hands tied behind my back. And then I said- If we didn't do anything to her, we would have a better outcome. <laughs> I, said, I, I could do that with my hands tied behind my back. And then I stopped and I looked at him and said, of course, if I tied your hands behind your back, it would work too. And he laughed and I said, okay, we got it. We got something going. So then I come back to Mennonite Bill and I'm all excited. I'm telling everybody about this. And they're like, this is Mexico, Katia. This isn't going to happen. Maybe in five, 10 years, it will happen, but you're going to have to work long and hard. This is not going to happen. Okay. That was in November, 2016. By April, 2017, we had our first birth at the hospital with the midwives running it. With sometime that summer, we had that room all fixed. And by October, we had, we had already had plenty of births. We had our official opening. So in less than a year, that, that happened. And I can tell you, it wasn't me. It was all these other, it was the right time at the right place. I remember going into one of the stores, sort of like the Home Depot kind of store, all the kind of thing, you know, that kind of stuff. And we were there looking for something for the house. And Dr. Stafford was at that place. And I said, what are you, and I said, hi, what are you doing out here? He says, I'm looking for good paint. And I said, oh, well, you know, I, I, he said, I'm trying to match these colors that you had in these. And they said, don't you have minions who do this for you? And he goes, I want it done right. And I don't want to have to redo it. I was like, okay, this is going to happen. That's when I knew it would happen. Knew it was serious business. Yeah. When the director of the hospital is going out to get pain, he was going to make it happen. So, you know, could it be reproducible? I don't know. It was just the right time at the right place. And the fact that the Mennonites they were also trying to encourage the Mennonites to come to the hospital. So it, it fit in with their, with their business plan and what they right. wanted. It, they, want, they could see that what was going on in Chihuahua, that poor people wanted a more humanized birth and stuff like that. So sometime last year, I basically turned it over to the midwives 
Casa Gabert, our business is not involved in it at all. We utilize the room, but we're not running the room anymore. And they're now working on training docs. If they want to use the room, they have to go through basically a humanized birth course and, you know, so that they know. And before we said they could use it as long as they had midwives in the room that were there to kind of make sure it didn't go, you know, south real fast. So that's where we are now. Oh, and the, we had the doula program before COVID. They were going in and volunteering and helping women uh, since COVID. And it's just starting a little bit maybe to open up, but the, the personnel change so often in that hospital, it's hard to get a real firm, yes, you can start doing this again. So we're kind of still waiting on the doulas accompanying the folks at the hospital, but that worked really well for a couple of years. That was really an amazing program too. Well, I just think I of all the momentum you are. I mean, just to think of if we had more midwives in the world like you, oh my goodness, what, what, what options would be out there? Like you, you are just so amazing to listen to, to me. <laughs> you got to, you got to realize, Leslie, I lived in, in Las Cruces and El Paso area for, I mean, I grew up, I, I was born in New Mexico. I grew up in El Paso. I got married in 89. I started my midwifery program business there in 91 and did that for you know years and years and years and I can say there were things that I really felt good about what I did in the community like raising up new midwives and I worked really hard at having a relationship with the nurse midwives at the hospital there was a program called first step there that really was all men um uh Medicaid folks, yeah. and they brought down the C-section rate there, right? A uh, huge, huge impact on our community. And a lot of the babies are born with the midwives to this day. But I felt really strongly they had to feel comfortable with what was going out in the out of hospital births so that when we ended up transferring, that the transfer would be smooth. Right. And that's that's always the biggest thing. If you don't have those relationships in your community, I don't care if you're in Mexico, Las Cruces, New York City, Timbuktu, if you don't have a good relationship with the people you're referring to, that's where it breaks down. That's when women die. That's when babies right. get neglected. And I'm not joking about women dying. They're dying because they're not getting the care because they just ignore them. I mean, well, yeah, just the breakdown of communication. I can tell you dozens and dozens of stories where you call and you want to give report and you can't even talk to the provider because if they think they ignore you, you'll go away. And I'm like, this, it's just, that's the safety breakdown is when you can't get that good. Con I know in um, the US, I don't know if it's a, a, the North America, the home birth summit, like trying to get that momentum of the bridging because it is, it's, it's gotten, it's gotten more disconnected, at least in the US, I've noticed because the midwives are so busy and the times that they, they do send or they can't create those meetings and those relationships it's getting harder to find good collaborating positions are our, our near retiring ones are the ones we want to keep forever in this next generation because they're not getting residency exposure they're not getting that midwifery um, collaboration model it's getting harder and harder and I don't know if you see that in Mexico as much as the U.S. So. Yeah, you, you have to kind of it's kind of different here because you kind of kind of have to look at this as being 1950s 1960s Okay. Um, with a bunch of 2000, you know, 21 thrown in every once in a while. And it's very, very strange because some things are just so easy, like they would have been, you know, 50 years ago in the States. And others, it's just you're drowning in paperwork, drowning in paperwork, which is true in the States too with the paperwork stuff. But, you know, what I did back then was I had a, a book club. And the only, only qualifications, you had to be a midwife to be in the book club. And we were only going to do books that had nothing to do with birth. You couldn't do a book about birth or, or a novel that had some, you know, it was mostly about a midwife or anything. It could be about anything else. And we did that for about six months. And then we all got too busy to do it anymore. That made more impact than any sit down and talk about policies and protocols and, and, yeah. and transfer from home, all of that, that did more to humanize love on each other. Nothing yeah. to do with 
what was going on. I mean, we ended up talking shop, you always do, but it was mostly about just creating a relationship. And, you know, I find that I teach my students, I teach my midwives and my doulas that the medical community is not the enemy. They're there to help us. And if we look at them as the enemy, they're going to react as if you think they're the enemy. So what's the best way to do that? Start thinking about somebody loves this person. Even if they're being a real crapola to you, somebody loves that person. And just think about that, you know, who loves this person? I bet his mama just thinks he's the, the most wonderful son in the world. And I bet his kids think he's the greatest dad and his wife must be so happy because he's a doctor. And you start looking at them as humans and then it all changes. And so then your heart opens and once mm -hmm. your heart's open, even if they're being a real bleep, 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 it's yeah. hard for them to stay there. Kill yeah, when you're kindness. smiling and you're killing them with kindness and you're just so excited, no matter what they say, to you, they're <laughs> like, I either need to figure out what she's smoking or like, I need to join yeah. her bandwagon. Like that's, right, that's the right. energy. And it's that, like, I talk a lot with professional development, the positive thinking, the, are you going to look at it half full, half empty? Are you going to kill with kindness? Like that momentum gets you leaps and bounds over critiquing and fighting and tension. And like, just why are we all here getting back to the mission? And we, they didn't become a doctor because they wanted to hurt people like <laughs> that, that's also a good one to say they did not because you walk in there and you're sure god put them in that place so they could punish you today right you know yeah. he did not go into medicine so he could be mean to me or my client he so could have picked did, our other professions to pick at some point in his life or her life right. they had a calling to help people <laughs> and and i can tell you you know it's one of the things i teach my parents if you get a chance ask them why they became a nurse Ask them why they became a doctor. Remind them why they're doing this. Because if you can remind them and praise them about, you know, their what was their motivation, that's going to click something. Inspire it to come back again. Yeah. It'll, even if it's just for a few minutes, you know. Like, yeah. And then I also teach people the Wonder Woman Beyonce stance. You know this one? Mm -mm. So this. Standing, standing with your hands on your hips. Okay. Um, if a doctor is yelling at you, <laughs> just go into this stance. Don't say anything. It's like putting up a sh that Wonder Woman shield, you know. Very interesting. And I, it's very. It trust you know. Trust me, it's a really. I might have to thing. test it on my husband. We get in an argument. I'm not going to say anything, and I'm going to put on that Wonder Woman wall. I don't know if it'll do the same <laughs> effect, but I'll try it. it. No, it will because he's like, "What's going on?" Because all you do is you this um, confidence, and okay. you know, go ahead, tell me what you want to say. I'm listening. Yep, I'm not cowering. I'm not running away. I'm not fighting yeah. back with you. I'm not getting to that level. Yeah, right. And uh, we had a doc who. Um, had promised not to cut the cord and had signed a birth uh, birth um, plan and everything. And as soon as the baby comes out, he's got the scissors and the doula and the dad are going, whoa, 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 and poof, you know, and, she, and the doula's like, you promise not to. And here he is, he's got blood on his, his gloves and he's shaking his gloves and he goes, if I hadn't cut that cord, she or that baby would have died. And she just went, that's not true. And he was like, he didn't, and he, and he, he diffused almost immediately. So when she called me up, she called me up, she said, Katia, you're never going to believe what happened. And her first words weren't that, because I told her, I said, I know this doctor, sweetheart, you got to be prepared. He's a liar. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's going to say one thing. He's going to do exactly the opposite. So just kind of be, no, he's promised. He's been so good. I said, just be ready. You know, she goes, you're never going to believe. And I said, so I'm ready for her to tell me about the cord, you know, and all that stuff. She goes, I did the Wonder Woman stance and it works. <laughs> so, you might have a whole secret for professional <laughs> development. We're going to do the Tia Wonder Woman stance. Like you're going to, you're going to be next to Ina May with the shoulder. So you're going to have like a Tia Wonder Woman stance. It's, like, it's Beyonce. Look it up online. Look up Beyonce and how she stands. But she you're stands. implementing it into midwifery. We're, we're tweaking it and patenting it to, to your situations. I see something you got going on, Katia. <laughs> I just partly it's to empower these these Mennonite ladies who will just they'll let anybody run roughshod over them and you got to teach them how to defend themselves you just do and not to let you know people are afraid to stand up to the doctors because they're afraid the doctors will do something evil 
And I said, they're not going to do that if all you, <laughs> it's a long, long other story that I'm not going to go into, but it was basically the, the attending doctor, I was saying, they don't want a C-section, they want a VBAC. And the attending said, well, it depends on what the obstetrician wants. And the dad overheard this behind the curtain. He said, actually, it's our right. So the word in Spanish is derecho. Mm -hmm. And so later, and anyway, they came with paper signing and, you know, we'll do whatever you want kind of thing. I said, uh, you said derecho, but they heard abogado, which is lawyer. You may have said, you said this word, but they heard, oh, we're going to get sued if we don't do this right. And I said, people need to know they have rights. They and they do everything they can to think that you don't sign this paper and you have to do exactly what you what you right. sign for. No, you yeah. can't sign your rights away. Yeah. And that simple truth has completely blown people away. What do you mean? Once I've signed a paper, it says that I have to, you know, because what they'll say is you signed a paper saying you would do a C-section. No, you didn't. Mm -mm. Informed consent means you have risk and benefits. You've been educated. It doesn't mean you're going to get pinned down and now you have no choices. Because that is, that happens all yeah. over the world. Like, because you sign a consent means you have no choices. It's going to happen to you. I said this, it just literally says you've been informed of your options. Like, it doesn't right. mean you're going to do anything. Like, and that's, and that's a, such a foreign concept to so many people. And yeah, right. I, I, I think it's amazing what you're doing in the community. And you've got a school and you're teaching mm -hmm. the next generation of the Mennonite ladies to serve their community. Yeah. And I just, yeah. So if, if there's any U.S. midwives that would love to be part of your euphoria community you're spreading, I know you're helping. No, 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 no. unless they're Mennonites and serving a very unusual community and don't want to be certified. And I'm all about if you have a good certification process like we do in the United States, you need to go through that. Okay. But there's some people who are in very, very isolated places. I created this school because these women had no other choices. Right. So now I do part of the school is also teaching about herbs. I have a childbirth herb course. I have a birth assistant course. I have a doula course. Those courses, I have no problems with the Americans coming in. Our midwifery course, our two-year course, we try and follow ICM, International, what is it? Confederation of Midwives? <laughs> yeah. so using that. I've, we try and follow their curriculum as much as possible. And um, we're trying to raise up these midwives here. There's no um, certification process here. We are recognized by Chihuahua because they allow us to do now, just as in March, allow us to do birth certificates. I said, this is better than any certification, ladies. This means they recognize you. Yeah. So, That's yeah. amazing. Anyway. Well, thank yeah, you. Many stories, sorry. <laughs> no, I love it, Katia. Do you mind if we put under the description or you want to say in the recording your email or some way if they have a question for you? I know you love to help change, inspire and give tips and suggestions to the next generation. You can definitely share my email. I'll be happy. If I don't answer you guys right away, just send it again. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And um, I will say that if there's somebody who wants to come down and volunteer for a while to help out, there are plenty of things that, uh, depending on what your interests are, that we would be, but not. Well, and I think anybody that's interested. considering international work or anybody thinking about becoming a midwife, like that's a perfect opportunity to get that exposure and see if this is a right fit for you. Because so many people like the idea of being a midwife, but until you can, you don't need to be paying for an expensive school and then doing clinicals. And now like volunteering is way cheaper than going halfway through school and figuring out this isn't a good fit for you. <laughs> this is not what I want to do with my life. Yeah, we have a whole process before we let people into the midwifery school and we train them first as doulas then as birth assistants then as um as uh, breastfeeding educators and then they can decide if they want to become a midwife by that time they've had exposure they have basically three career paths that they can play with or yeah. not and, yep. and that's what Hillary and I talked about. I think she was re recommending your model you'd created because it makes total sense. They can stop at this level they've got, or they can go to the next level. They can say, okay, I'm going to pursue. I've gotten involved at X, Y, Z. I think that's so smart. Well, and also this whole idea of spending thousands and thousands of dollars for your midwifery school. And then once you've paid it, you're not going to get a refund after, no. after a certain time. No. But if you're doing it by career path and Or, or, and then
and life happens too. You can quit because you're done and I don't want to do this. Or you can quit because you're going to have a baby and you want a year off and yeah, so, oh and that's, goodness. that's what I had to do that kind of model because of the ladies here. They, they aren't going to leave to go get training. They will not leave the community. And, you know, one person, they quit their training for a while because they became youth leaders in their church. And they said, it was, she said, I want to make sure I do whatever I do. I do it well. And I said, that's great. Cause most of us try and do everything and then screw up at all. You know? Right. Just rush, rush, rush. So no, nope. I think that's very wise win wisdom. So thank you so much for your time today, I, Katia. It was truly a pleasure. It was a pleasure talking with you, Leslie. And thank you for letting me share my story. Okay. I'll have a wonderful day. You too. Bye.